Hi. Hi, I'm here. Yeah, I okay, I got you down, Mia. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Good morning, dear friends. We're on page 55, and today we're going to talk about the descendancy of Mashiach, meaning which family and which tribe he comes from, and the Shevet of kingship changed. There was a change in Klal Yisrael that the kingship of the future Mashiach took a seismic change from one Shevet to another Shevet, <coughs> from one king to another king. Does anyone know who that change involves? So originally it was Sha'ul HaMelech, King Saul was the original, and Sha'ul came from which tribe? Binyamin, that is correct. That's where things started, where Sha'ul came from. He was chosen to be the Melech. However, he made a mistake. He did not wipe out King Agag, if you remember correctly, and he lost, and his entire Shevet lost out, and instead it shifted to Yehuda. Yehuda. So the tribe since then that Mashiach comes from is Yehuda. So why did it go to Yehuda specifically? So Yehuda was chosen because of the leadership qualities that were seen in Yehuda. That was the short end of it. And from Yehuda, of course, comes the first king from Yehuda, who is David. David HaMelech. So when we talk about Mashiach, the expression you're going to hear a lot is Mashiach ben David. This was all prophesied in the Torah itself, although Mashiach himself is explicitly not mentioned in the Torah. We'll see why later in future classes. The tribe is, and let's have a look on page 55. So Yaakov Avinu knew full well that the shift was going to happen. As it says in Barishis, 49.10, Lo Yasur Shevet Liuda, the scepter, that is a royal scepter, is not going to depart from Yehuda, or Mochek Mibain Raglav, and a ruler's staff from between his feet. This is a reference to the power and leadership of kings, which go to Yehuda. Ad Kiyavo Shiloh. Who's Shiloh? Until your Shiloh arrives. Mashiach. Mashiach. That's one of the four possible names of Mashiach, we said last class. Shai Lo, he's going to be a gift to the world, and people are going to bring him gifts. Velo Yekat Amim, and people, all peoples, are going to be obedient to him. Yeah. If it says the scepter shall not depart from Yehuda until the arrival of Shiloh, does that mean that it's going to shift to something else when Mashiach comes? No, mm -hmm. it means it's always going to remain. However, kingship is going to disappear for a large period of time when we are in Galut. When we're in exile. Which is right now. So there will be, which we're still in. So we're going to see a period of time. Remember, that's the dream of Yaakov Avinu on Harabayat. There's going to be a time where kingship is going to be removed because of the final galut of Edom, Romi, and then it's going to return. However, the principle of kingship remaining inside the Jewish people is always going to be there. Oh. Even though you won't see kings among the Jewish people for a long time. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth? Do we know why Shabbat Binyamin was originally chosen? That was really, uh, Shaul was the key person for that. The qualities of the leader brought the kingship into his domain. But I'm saying, like, why who chose him? Like, I don't know. Oh, uh, Hashem? Like, that, that, was a godly, that was a godly thing. Okay, here are our guests. Yeah. Hello, welcome. Oh, wow. wow. Half of Great Nick just walked into my class. <laughs> okay, wait. Okay, thanks. Okay. I'll again. Um, yeah, we have a few seats over here. Okay. Come. 
It's not scary. Don't be shy, don't be intimidated. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome. Hi, take a seat. Don't worry. Welcome everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Welcome to Stern College. Okay, Sayal, could you close the door, please? Thank you so much. Uh, for those who just walked in, we're discussing the Shia. We're halfway through our course, pretty much. And we're talking about the tribe that Mashiach comes from, which we discovered became Yehuda. That was plan B after Shaul HaMelech did not fulfill his potential of wiping out Amalek. And we're going to see that wiping out Amalek is going to be a major part of this. Okay, let's have a look at the Tarim Yonasan, bottom of page 55. He translates into Aramaic, and a translation by definition is a commentary, and says... There's never going to cease to be kings and rulers from the house of Yehuda. That means kingship, kings, may disappear from the Jewish world, but kingship will always be there. We're always going to see kings coming from Yehuda and teachers of Torah to thousands, because Yehuda also produced teachers, until the King Mashiach comes, who is going to be one of the descendants of Yehuda. David. David Amela specifically, yeah. That's very, very important. The Abarbanel, Don Isaac Abarbanel from Spain, yeah. Um, what does it mean that there, there will be kingship if there will be kings? Mean that we're going to see a long period of time where there will be no kings because the Jewish people are in Galilee. You cannot have a Jewish king if all in exile. However, that does not take away from the concept of kingship that will always be there. It's not mavatel, it's not nullified. That means we're going to see kings arise again. It's not like the entire royal family and royal lineage has disappeared. It's still there. You'll see a little bit more in the next piece. I will just mention a Kabbalistic interpretation of Don Isaac Abarbanel, who lived in Spain in the 1400s. And he has a commentary on Sefer Daniel. In the ninth chapter of Sefer Daniel, he's actually said that the prophet Daniel was one of the few people who actually did know the arrival time of Mashiach. And it says, Va'avdi David, Melech HaMashiach Yem Zerah David. Mashiach will be a descendant of King David. By the way, he's going to have to prove that he is a descendant of King David. How he's going to do that, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. It's going to be very interesting. Aval Balea Kabbalah. Those who study mystical Judaism, Shekaim Kibru Das Gilgul Nefashot, who accept upon themselves the idea of Gilgul Neshamot, a.k.a. Reincarnation. Amru, Shemelech HaMashiach, that this King Mashiach, Yeh David Atzmo, the David HaMelech himself, is going to reincarnate and come back to the Jewish people. Ki Nefesh David, because the soul of King David, Tit Galgel, the Melech HaMashiach, is going to be reincarnated into Mashiach himself. That is the Babanel, who's a very respect, a respectful authority, giving us a little Kabbalistic insight to we say Mashiach ben David. We literally mean Mashiach in the form of David, because David himself is coming back. A little bit of Kabbalah if you Tuesday morning, yeah. All that entails is that like a piece of David's soul is in whoever this person is. How much, what percent, we did, we did make a distinction between the entire soul of a person coming back into reincarnation and pieces this seems to be like a major chunk of a it. A good amount of soul. A goodly amount okay. of David Amalek, whatever that means. How are we going to figure this out, whether we have Mashiach or not? So one of the things we're going to see today that Mashiach is going to have to produce is a book of lineage. A Sefer Yuchsin to prove that his great, 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 grandfather was David Amalek. But how's he going to do that? He's going to have to prove it. If he doesn't produce that document or that evidence, because I personally believe it won't be a document, but it will be a, a, another form of evidence, he can't be Mashiach. It's actually a crucial part to prove that he is Mashiach. That means his father's father's father. That means if someone claims that their father is not a human but God, obviously they can't be Mashiach. You get it? Very, very important distinction. But that doesn't concern us because we're Jewish, yeah. 
Um, what else would prove that? I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I want this one. Oh, what else will prove that he is actually? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Do you think he could be like DNA testing? So, I believe so. But let's just look at it through the non-DNA version. I believe it will a form of DNA testing, which is becoming more and more sophisticated as we move on. We know there are, there used to be actually, various families, many families, especially before the war, who had books, literal books, that showed their father, their father's father, their father's father's father, and this genealogy in a book. I met an Argentinian Jew whose family survived the Holocaust, moved to a neighborhood next to mine, and he had a book on his table, a thick book, that had his lineology all the way back to the Maral of Prague, who has, a, who has a descendancy from Rashi. Rashi had proof that he's from David Melech. Actually, his went back even further. His went back to Adam Arishon, which is pretty crazy. Right? So I mean, he has to be a pretty Rashi thick book. Could have been Mashiach? No, no. Oh. His descendancy is from Mashiach. Okay. He's not Mashiach. He's dead. If you're right, dead, you can't Mashiach. Think no one ever dead. thought that Rashi oh, was okay. Mashiach ever. He never claimed he was, that's for Shalom. But he did have lineage from David Amela, that's for sure. So if you can pull yourself back, right, that far with one of these books. Now these books, unfortunately, in the Holocaust and during the expulsion of about a million Jews out of the Middle Eastern world, these books got lost. But you pretty much had a book to prove that you came from Mashiach. There's very few of such books that exist anymore. However, we do have, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, DNA testing that is really starting to give yichus, starting to give genealogy to people and locate them into a tribe. Now, even right now, and this is all going to be important now for a few minutes, we're going to see, but also proving that a person is Jewish, they are starting to incorporate, not use for absolute proof in Israel, the Rabbanut, that a person is Jewish using their DNA. It's not enough in and of itself right now. That's going to change, I believe, as it gets more and more sophisticated and more targeted. But there are a lot of uh, the Rabbanut will use, in addition to other proofs, whether it's cemeteries and other documents and weddings and divorce documents, whatever it is, to prove that a person is actually Jewish. That's going to be very important as well, as we'll see in a few moments. But proving that he comes from that tribe, and specifically David of Melech, is going to be crucial, yeah. Um, also, just going back to when we were saying that, um, like, uh, David Amalek is going to coronate Mashiach. Will it be I didn't say David is going to coronate him. I said he's going to have to be a direct descendant of King David. No, the that, prophet is okay. going to coronate him. But, well, Abarbanel said that, you know. Abarbanel said that he is a, he's a two things. The non capitalist interpretation of the Abarbanel was that he's going to be a direct descendant and have to prove that he's a direct descendant of David Amalek. Oh, okay. Okay? The prophet who's going to exist before, and which prophet, by the way, is probably going to coronate him? Eliyahu. Eliyahu Navi. Very good, Anya. Yeah. Why can't, like, okay, so I understand why he needs to prove that, you know, he came from um, King David, but how come Hashem can't just announce all of us, oh, hi, whoever creates a pillar of fire in front of them is the next Mashiach? And why can't God do what precisely? Just like say, oh, this miracle will, will happen to this one person. And That's a very good question. Why can't God just be like, okay, why here's the information? That's a very, very fair question. I mean, the same question could be asked of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why did the Jewish people have to go through this whole cat and mouse? Is the Redeemer? Is he not? Right? Proving himself. The answer to that question, which may be the same as this question, because he was the Mashiach of his day. He was the king of his day, Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu, if I say Torah and Melch, I meant Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm sorry. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, actually, Torah and also had to prove, by the way, himself. Ramat also with the Goliath, and he was the youngest of seven sons, right? And he had to go and prove himself that way as well. That's all to do with building the emunah of the people in his day. That's what that's really all about. Same thing. It's going to take a little bit of time. He's going to have to prove that he's there, and that's going to bring with him a lot of people who are going to be attracted and move towards him. A lot of people. In the days of Moshe Rabbeinu, even the era of Rav, even Egyptians. Um, but it is going to become provable, yeah. Good? You had a question? Maybe yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. So let's have a look at the personal qualities of Mashiach given to us by the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 2. And let's have a look at them. Remember, we said that 
Mashiach is going to be a very charismatic person. Lashon Mashiach, the word Mashiach, is a lashon of srara ugadula, of great leadership and strength. He's going to be a tremendous leader. But not any time. There's some bad leaders out there. Right? He's going to be a good leader. Let's have a look. The Nachal of Ruach Hashem. He's going to have God resting upon him. Ruach Chachma. He's going to have a lot of Chachma wisdom. By the way, what's between Chachma and that? Why? What's, what is Chachma anyway? Is it one wisdom and one's knowledge? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge is my question. Oh, okay. like knowing between good and bad? Or a person with knowledge could know the difference between good and bad. Could they not? Mm-hmm. What's the difference between Chachma, Bina, and Dad? Chachma, Bina, and Dad. Three words we use for Chabad, yeah. <laughs> Buffer everywhere. Um, I don't remember like which one's which, but I'm pretty sure like one of them is just like fact, like knowledge, like he's, this okay. is the information, another one is more like... Dat is the information, very, very good. So this is how most commentators, Russia understands it this way, I believe. Dat is information, knowledge, stuff you know, stuff you can verify, right? You put something into Google, you get that. Not so impressive, if you think about it. I mean, it's just like stuff you gather together. Then you have wisdom. Now, wisdom is sometimes, and in many cases, very different to that. We know many people who are very knowledgeable and yet lack wisdom. They're not wise people. They have no chokhmah. Chokhmah actually is lashon. Two words put together. Chokhmah is what? Koachmah. Chokhmah, very good. Who said that? Koachmah. Koachmah, the power of what? The power of understanding. Koachmah, chokhmah. I have the power of understanding through experience, getting to know information. Maybe the dat does not apply in this situation. Maybe it's going to take chokhmah in order to understand something. <coughs> He's going to have a lot of chokhmah. Very, very wise. When you go for advice, you go to a wise person, not always just a knowledgeable person. That's why when you have a disease, you don't go to WebMD, which is the worst <laughs> website on the planet. Because yeah. no matter how small your symptoms are, you always think you're going to die. Especially if you're Jewish. Okay? You don't go, that's knowledge. Right? Because that 0.1% of cases, you're convinced, will apply to you. Chachmah takes more information, more understanding. It's relative. It's objective. It's also subjective. There's a lot more uh, to it. I'm overstating it, but that's basically it. So he's going to have Chachmah. He's going to have Bina. What's Bina? Understood. So more of an intuitive thing from inside you. Right? Bina is the, they say, the feminine trait. That doesn't just mean it's within women, by the way. But it means it's a feminine trait of having a, like an intuition. It's hard to put words to these concepts because they're sometimes beyond words. An inner understanding. So when my wife says, I don't trust that person. Why? Because I don't. I got a feeling. Then you trust your wife. Because she has <laughs> Bina. Ruch Eitza. What's Eitza? Advice. Advice. He's going to give us advice. He's going to be a person who advises other people. By the way, not just Jewish people. We already saw last class from Isaiah the prophet that many nations are going to stream, literally stream to Israel to go for advice from this individual. Or Gavura. What's Gavura? Strength. strength. What kind of strength? All strength. Well, strength. not physical strength. Head strength. Right? Mental strength. Right? A great leader has strength to make decisions, to hold by them, to go against the masses that go against him. Right? Someone's able to kovish a city. Kovish an ear is one, but here is a gavura of a person who's in self control, strength of decision making. Yeah? Ruach dat. He's also going to have dat. He's going to have tremendous knowledge. We're going to see. He's going to be a massive Talmud Chacham. And most importantly, and lastly, Yirat Hashem. All those things are meaningless to us unless you have Yirat Hashem. Fear of God in all your knowledge, wisdom, intuition, understanding. Fear of Shemayim. Fear of God in all your decision making. Yeah. Um, this is a question if it's too unrelated, you can tell me so. But is, can he 
can this person, whoever it is, be false to Shiva? Like, if he's still from, obviously from Yehuda, but do you have to be like born religious? And Absolutely religious? not. Great question. I've been asked that before, actually. Will he be a Baal Tshuva? Could well be. He can't be a Ger. He can't be a convert. Because he has come from Shevet Yehuda. Okay? However, well, he's actually going to have something to do with converts. We'll see in a minute. However, he can be a Baal Tshuva. He can grow up anywhere in the world. That is not a prerequisite. He's going to have to live in Israel because he's going to be a king of Israel. But could be a Baal Tshuva? Yes. Could Leah Shevis marry him? We said last class. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If he's into women from South Africa. Yeah. So if it's somebody who's like going to have this like immense fear of God in a sense, how are they going to like know that it's them, I'm saying? Because like if they're like that respectful of God, and very, they're very, not going to like assume like, that well, they're No, no, no. Remember, let's look back. Did David and Mela no, but know that's he was king from birth? Were, like in days of prophecy I know, so what? and whatnot, so but like, what? be prophecy will again. he get prophecy when he's born? Will someone? No, you're not. How no will one. He know when he's nobody born is born a prophet. Okay, so nobody, in general, prophecy is at any a, point, how will he know? Prophecy it's is a skill that a person grows in. He will become aware that he's a potential candidate. There's no doubt about it. But remember, he's only going to get the job once Hashem decides. That is his job. Moshe right. Rabbeinu was not born a prophet. Right. And he was born in a palace because he had to be a redeemer. Therefore, he could be born a slave. And at some point in his life, much later in his life, he's standing at the burning bush. He's like, oh, by the way, you're the redeemer. You're the Mashiach of the day. You're the king. Right? He was like 80 years old. So we know that you're not born that way. You're not going to be born a prophet, right? No one's born right, a prophet. Right, no, not born, but like in general, like, okay, let's say he's 25 years old. And that's what, like, how does he know? He will know. Okay. He will understand oh. and he's going to have to prove it. It will become clear to him. Yeah. You said he has to live in Israel. Does yeah. he have to live in Israel in his time or when he becomes Mashiach? I don't know the answer to that. He's going to have to reveal himself in Eretz Yisrael. Okay. So we can assume that for a period of time he will be in Eretz Yisrael. He does not have to be like, born to in the land to of Israel. Israel. He can be born in Alabama. Okay. Right? It makes no difference. Why he chose that state? I don't even know. But he's going to be born somewhere. Okay? Uh, and it could be outside of Eretz Yisrael. There is a certain Kedusha to an individual, by the way, who is born in the land of Israel. There is something inherent there, so one could lean towards that for sure, but Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't. Just saying. So those are the six qualities of Wait, what are the Mashiach. We said Chachma Mina Das, Yer Shemayim, and then... The Yer Tashem, fear of God. Those are your six qualities. Oh, and Gura. Okay. Yeah. Thank Gura. you. Yes, Elizabeth. Was there ever going to be, like, if we obviously see that Moshe and Aharon come from Shabbat Levi, was there ever going to be... No, 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 it cannot be. You cannot be a Kohen and be Mashiach as well. Too well. And there is a Kohen Mashiach, but no. Had to be a very specific person. And remember, 99.99999% of people in Shevet Yehuda also don't get the job. Who'd want this job? I don't even know. So I want to be president of America, La I don't know who in their right mind would want such a terrible job. Well, you said they're not going to want it. They're going to be like. Could be. No. I mean, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu had to be. Moshe Rabbeinu argued for one week. One week. To have his older brother Aaron get the job. David and Mela as well. Shaul, Tanakh tells us, was Nechbala Kalim, hid among the baggage and the suitcases, so not to be chosen by the prophet or to be king. One of the traits to be king of Israel is you don't want the job. If someone says, I want the job, you better be careful. For I think with the narcissists, and there have been other people in Jewish history who want to be kings, and in most cases ended up acting very badly for the Jewish people. Remember, kings have tremendous power. Stuff we can't even fathom. Can't even fathom. What about Mashiach ben Yosef? That's another individual, and maybe not even necessarily individual. Some modern scholars say it's a time period. Seemingly, it is a person who is going to die in a war, potentially, by someone called Armilus for Mashiach. But that's not what we're discussing here. That's a, a, a prelude to Mashiach ben David. Okay, let's have a look at the Rambam because things are going to get even stranger. Check this out. So we have these six qualities of Mashiach. Says the Rambam in the laws of Malachim. So now we moved into the days of Mashiach himself. Now he's king. He's on his Malchot. All the Jewish people are going to gather towards this individual. And he's going to do something. He's going to tell them 
Their yichus. What's yichus? Lineage. Their lineage. What lineage? Like what does that mean? Their sheva, their their ancestry. So number one, he's gonna he's know. gonna have to tell them, says the Rambam, which shevet they come from. Why do we care about that? What, what why do we care what tribe they come from? Why is that even important? Based on Excel. What about the base of Who's gonna work? Where, you Where are they gonna live? Yeah. Israel is divided up into tribes. We can assume it will be divided again in some way, shape, or form. So we're gonna see the tribes going to various parts of that, which is going to be much, much larger. So he's going to have to figure out where Israel is, how far it goes, and who is from which tribe. There are, today, how many tribes do we have that we know about for sure? Ten. How many tribes do we have today? Pretty much two. Yehuda? And? No. No. Levi, that the Kohenim also come from. Those are the only two tribes you really have today. Now there are people out there, many people, some of the good people, some of the not good people, who claim they're from different tribes. Right? We see, for example, the wonderful Ethiopians, say they're from Shevet Dan. We see many Indians say they're from Shevet Menashe. It's so far back that it's very difficult to prove that information. Mashiach is going to have to. But the other tribes are going to return. They are scattered around the world and says as I the prophet, he's going to gather together the Jewish people, mi arba comfort, ha'aretz, from the four corners of the earth. That's referring to all the Jewish people who are everywhere. Now, Mashiach is going to be a major player in that because he's going to have to define which tribe you come from. But there's something else that Mashiach is going to have to do as well, and that is tell us who is a Jew. Ooh. Oh, now that's a big job. Because there are many people out there who all of you have met who think they're Jewish, but actually they're not. Or people who don't think they're Jewish, who actually are. So that is the yichus job, among other things, that Mashiach is going to have to figure out whether you're a Jew. And if you think you are and you're not, you'll have an opportunity to convert. That's why we're seeing a lot of converts join our ranks recently. People from the most disparate backgrounds and races and ethnicities and these holy sparks, these holy individuals are joining our people as part of the pre-Messianic drama that is coming our way. And thank goodness for that, because most Jews, let's be honest, don't sing and dance well. Suddenly, we got the best singers, we got the best <laughs> dancers. It's worked out great. Could you open the, um, the window behind you so we have a little fresh air in here, yeah? Um, you heard it, yeah. Why? You got another ten tribes coming, sister. Where are they? Ruben, Shimon, Levi, Hudi, Yisachar, Zavon, and Dunnah, Salikoshi, Yosef, and Yamah. Is it part of Mashiach's job to get them back? Yeah! So if he has to come to all the Jews that are in the world now and just say, like, hi, Mashiach, like prove your lineage. It's already started. We're already seeing people move to... You now, my wife told me, I think on our wedding day, or someone else's <laughs> wedding day, I don't remember, it happened too long ago now, but she said, one of the signs of Mashiach is coming, she heard this, and I didn't understand why, because I didn't know anything about Mashiach when I got married. I didn't know much when I got married, actually. Um, that before Mashiach comes, we're going to see Ashkenazim and Sephardim get married. We're going to see this mixing. A little too excited there, Shem. A little too excited. We're going to see how she's Ashkenazi and Sephardi. So she said that. Well, she said it at someone else's wedding. And I met her under a chuppah of a wedding that I performed of an Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Thanks for coming, guys. Oh, hope to see you again. Bye. bye. I hope you all join Stern. See you soon. See you soon. Nice to meet you guys. Enjoy your day. But do you get my question? <laughs> Once I haven't finished my point yet. So we're going to see these coming together, these Ashkenazim and Sephardim. Why are we going to see this? I never understood why, but it makes sense. Because if we gather all the Jews together, you, you mean your ancestors were in Poland or Russia, right? They never met anyone from any other place. They never saw a Moroccan Jew or an Iranian Jew or an Algerian Jew. And say, if you're living up in Morocco or Iran, there's no Polish people walking around, Polish Jews walking around. Now we're seeing the kibbutz galiot, the gathered together of all the... Nations. Thank you. Now there's a strong chance they're going to get married to each other. Right, but like... Look at all these Mashiach just started, and like, just, like, 
like right now, yeah. Then, like, true. to prove your lineage that you're from Yehuda, you just have to prove that you're not a poet and a lady. Oh, but which tribe do you actually come from? There's plenty of people walking around. There are many people walking around right now who come from other Shabbatim, which is not aware of it. So we call them Yisrael. But we know where they come from. If you're a Kohen, we can prove it, right? Yeah. I mean, even that's so simple, by the way. I took a little trip of students to Warsaw, right, on a Holocaust trip, and then to, you know, Auschwitz and Maidan and all the rest of it. And the coolest place in Warsaw is the Warsaw Cemetery. You've got to visit it. It's like hundreds of acres. Thousands and thousands of Jews buried there from hundreds of years, right? You see a lot of people walking around and doing a lot of history. Um, understand? And we had a kid among us and walking around, and he said, Oh, my great 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 grandfather's buried over here or something like that, whatever it was. We go there, and on his tombstone of this kid are hands like this. He's a guy. And he found it. I'm like, He's like, Why are the hands, Rabbi? He went to the tombstone, he pulled us over, his hands like this. I said, that's your great-great-grandfather? He's like, yeah, it's my grandfather. He goes, you're a co. And he goes, I am? I'm like, yeah. You can't be in there. you got to get out. You have to walk straight out. Oh my God. So I took a photo for the tombstone for him. All right? Because there's many people today who don't realize they're co-anim. And vice versa. People who think they're co-anim. And actually they are, they are not co-anim. All right? So it's also, just give the last name, co is medium. And many people with the name Rappaport, for example, Tradition we know are Cohen and Brochatha Donai Elohim and Abraham Shonai Bro. I mean, wait, so not everyone with the last name Cohen is a Cohen? Not at all, yeah. Oh! But I thought that when my yes, Shabbat is like revealed, people won't be allowed to convert anymore. We'll have a chance. There's going to be a window of opportunity. We're not sure when the window closes, there will be an opportunity for them to convert. When Thousand percent. Them, yeah, yeah, I believe so, yeah. So, um,. I'm wondering about what you said earlier about the tribes. Like, what's going to be the purpose of splitting up the land of Israel between the tribes? Like, why can't we all? Just well, what was the original? If that's going to happen, which I learned it will happen, each tribe is given a specific area because their mission as a shevet is dependent upon the piece of land that they have. It's not just like dividing up the tribes. Each shevet has a specific mission. Some need to be near the water. Some need to be in the north of Israel. Some need to be in Yerushalayim. Right? <coughs> Makes sense because they need to be near, you know. So every tribe has its own mission depending on the piece of land that it's given. So if that does happen again, it's going to be important where you are. If. If. Yeah. Um, I'm in the Bama Price's Tribes of Israel class this semester. There's a Tribes of Israel class here? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really good. And basically what she's teaching is about how, like, every single tribe has, like, a STEM-like personality chart and like character traits according to that tribe. Absolutely. So is it possible that like with psychology like advancing, like with people taking certain personality tests, you can like figure out which tribe they're from? <laughs> you want to use Myers-Briggs, <laughs> ENTPs. That's the teachers, right? The sailors are uh, ISTJs. I mean, what do you want to say? Okay, it could be. I mean, it sounds cute. It could well be. Really I mean, there's, there's very specific yeah, personality types. I actually use Myers-Briggs a lot. In my counseling practice, you see that it helps a lot in understanding people. Could that be related to your mission in Klal Yisrael? Yeah, 100%. Could that be divided by tribe as well? It's a cute idea. I got no clue, but it sounds cute. It's a Dvar Torah. Tell that right now. Okay, let's Are finish off the Ramba. We haven't even figured out exactly how he gets this. Okay, fine. That's his job. He's going to take every single Jew and tell you whether you are a Jew or not a Jew. Right? And by the way, many of you have met people who think they're Jewish and actually they're not and vice versa. It's not just going in. There's people who don't realize they're Jewish. You, you definitely met such people. Mm -hmm. People who think they are. There's tons of them out there. Yeah. Alpiv Baruch HaKodesh. He's going to do this through his mouth. Through Ruach HaKodesh Shatanuach love that's rested upon him. That's the Ruach HaKodesh we mentioned. Those six types. He's going to use that power to do it. He will determine which tribe everyone comes to. He's going to say, you come with this Shevet, you come with that Shevet. So the Rambam says exactly what he's going to use, this power. It's a very specific and unique type of prophecy. Yeah. Is there a difference between Ruach HaKodesh and the Dua? There is a difference. Sometimes they use kind of interchangeably. We have Ruach HaKodesh today, we do not have Ruach today. Nevo is a higher level of Ruch HaKodesh. 
Yeah, but Navu is going to return. Full blown Navu is going to return. But now do we kind of just like interchange the two? Ruch Kodesh does exist. Okay? How is he going to figure this out? So the prophet even tells us this. And this is fascinating. And this is based upon the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3. Look at this verse on page 57 at the top. It says the prophet, Ve'ericho b'yirat Hashem. He's going to be Ve'ericho. Now, if you look in your translations, they translate this as very animated, very animated individual. That's what Mashiach is going to be, an animated person. Velo b'yirat Hashem, in faith and in fear of God. Velo l'mare enav yishpat. He's not going to judge people with his eyes. He's not going to judge people according to what he sees. And he's not going to judge them based upon the evidence that he hears. So the prophet has removed two forms of understanding when it comes to Mashiach's judgment ability. Gone! Are what he sees and God know what he hears. Well, that's crazy. Because when a judge has to make a decision, they base it upon the evidence that they see and the evidence that they hear, based on their own understanding and based upon the testimony of the witnesses. Well, if that's gone, what's left? Says Rava in the Gemara. Actually, the Posk is telling us. Ve'ericho b'irat Hashem. Ve'ericho also has the word inside it, reach, smell. He is going to smell. There is a form of prophecy which comes through smelling, understanding through smell. What does that mean? That's so weird. So we're not too sure. But let's have a look at the five senses that a person is given. And we'll see there is something unique about the sense of smell. I feel like it's you can't describe it the way you can describe the other senses. Like if I touch something and like, you know, like I sense it, like, oh, like feel how this feels. Like if you're not in the room and I tell you like it smells so good, you, you can obviously like imagine that smell, but you can't like actually. So, very, very good. So smell seems to be a sense that is above the natural order. Where did you get this power from? Gun Eden. We have to go back to Adam and Chava, because Adam and Chava were told not to eat from the Yitzhadat. That was listening. And they touched it, which is touching. And they heard God say it, and they tasted it. But one thing they did not do, and they saw it, but they did not smell it. That, see, the Kabbalists and others, shows that the smell sense, reich, reach, is the purest and most untainted of all the senses. The power of smell is the most spiritual sense that we have. When you smell something, in English they call the olfactory system, it's the thing that is most related to zahira, memory. It takes you right back, mm -hmm. right? You smell something and you are catapulted into the past in order to engage in that thing. It bypasses the brain almost. It bypasses what you see and it takes you back. It's the deepest and the undeep. That's why Lashon Reach is related to Ruchniyut, spirituality. It's the most spiritual sense that we have. Somehow, this form of prophecy is going to go higher and deeper than any other form of prophecy. Maybe this is a reference to some form of DNA analysis, I believe it is, right? Because when you smell, they can use various checks. It could be, that's what it comes from. By the way, was this form of prophecy ever used or tested? Because remember, this is also a test case. Not only to show us Mashiach's job, but also to prove that he is Mashiach. And it was used before, says the Gemara. There was someone referred to as Bar Kochba. Bar Kochba was a potential Mashiach. And great rabbis of the day believed that he was. 
he wasn't. And the rabbis went and they tested him. And they said, if you're Mashiach, we know from the prophecy of Isaiah that you have the ability to smell and determine information. And they said, let's see you do it. And they checked him out and he failed the test. Whatever that test of the Rabbanim was in those days, we do not, we're, not, we're not privy to that information for reasons that maybe we can figure out. He failed the test. And because of that, he was rejected, not just from, not just from, it's a prophecy, it's a form of prophecy that is rooted in smell. Not only was he rejected from the job of Mashiach, he was rejected from the Jewish people. Why? And actually he was given up because he kept pushing himself as a Messiah uh, and eventually he lost that job and he overdid it and he ended up being killed by the Romans. Some say the reason he was killed was because the Jewish people released their protection from this individual. And for the rest of history, he's known as Bar Kaziba, which is a pejorative term. Yeah. What if, like, the test, the testers, like, the Rabbanim, I'm not saying, like, anything bad, but, like, what if they don't know the real answers? Like, what if, if they don't know... Like, this is a, being... this will be, I, we can assume we're done by the Sanhedrin. Among them will be prophets, because prophet is going to return before Mashiach comes. So this is going to be a conclusive proof. I just gave you an example in history of how the rabbis of the day use such a test to disprove a potential Mashiach, right? That information and that knowledge base is going to return to the Jewish people. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to change before Mashiach comes. But it could well be in our day and age that it's going to take on some form of natural, scientific proof in order to, uh, to prove it. In, like we don't we don't necessarily know that we're like like uh, <laughs> you know what I mean like no, when Mashiach comes I don't know what you mean <laughs> when Mashiach comes yeah. it's not like we're all just gonna like change like we're all no there's gonna be a noticeable change in the world when Mashiach comes there's gonna be a noticeable change there's going to be prophecy returning and people are going to understand, they're going to know and there's going to be a select group of great people who are going to determine whether he is actually Mashiach. Among them, Eliyahu Navi, who's going to come before that great day. We're going to get in a before Mashiach comes. Yeah. Uh, it may not be widespread, but it will yeah. exist before he comes. Yeah. I was in the workplace reading for every day. Yeah, it's going to come afterwards. He's going to build a beat to make this. We're going to get there right now. Yeah. Karbana are going to return. I have yeah. two questions. Number one, is Bar Kokhba going to come back? When no. Comes? Okay. Absolutely not. Number two, does this whole smell thing have anything to do with the smells that we're not allowed to smell, like from the guitarist? Who says you cannot smell from the guitarist? I mean? thought there's like things like we're not allowed to smell like frankincense. Is that not a thing? You're not allowed to make the guitarist right now. Okay, but we're allowed to smell because it. Because we're allowed to. Well, it doesn't exist right now. Those 11 spices. If you were to know exactly what they were and the right combination would be allowed. The family who made the spices was the Avtinas family. And I wrote a whole essay for a book on this one. For lost, they're gonna come back. There is a secret recipe. Oh. And they know it. That you're not allowed to do that until the beta is returned. But they knew that their family would have this secret of information and it would come back to the Jewish people. Among others, a lot of more information to return to the Jewish people. And once you have kingship, I mean, it's up for grabs, isn't it? I love the secrecy. Okay, page 58. Why is it a secret, though? It's so Something, a secret. It's just a lot of information was lost in the sands of time. The Bin Galut, most Jews don't read Hebrew. There's no secret about that. It's a very sad thing. You know, most Jewish kids don't know the word Shema Yisrael, Adonai, 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 Achad. Right? No secret about that. It's just this information was lost because of the Galut, because of the exile. That's why the Avtinas family were actually depressed because they knew that this information would be lost with the generations. Yeah. What about like the different artifacts, like menorah and? Coming back, being rebuilt. Well, is one ready to go? Rebuilt or like we'll get it back? Because like people say that, like the Romans or like different. People yeah, they do them. say that somewhere in the Vatican. Oh, the church, there's yeah. a lot of traditions on that. Maybe it's there. Maybe it's probably not. It's probably been, it was stolen and smelted down for its uh, gold value at some point. One of the menorahs. I know that the Arch of Titus has a depiction in the relief of the menorah being taken out, but um, it was stolen or taken at some point. I don't believe it's there anymore. Although we joke about it, you know, every time the Prime Minister of Israel goes to visit the Pope, 
always brings a menorah as a gift around Hanukkah time and says, if you see one looks like this and you're one of your, uh, you know, <laughs> catacombs, please return it to us. I mean, they do have a lot of stuff down there, a tremendous amount of stuff. Books, farim, right? Kiss their rambam. We know that for sure. Why don't they give it back? You ask them. Yeah. Oh God, I remember I went to the Coliseum and I had a Jewish tour guide, and like in the center of the Coliseum, you see this like black of Hebrew writing, and we're like, oh, what is this? In the Coliseum? I was in the Coliseum. I'm like on the floor or something. What? So they just took it and they leave it like garbage on the floor. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't see that. Many it. Jews lost their lives in the Coliseum. It was built actually around the same as the, not just Titus, as a uh, part of the celebration, yeah, of the conquest of Jerusalem, yeah. Oh. There's actually a law you're not allowed to walk, made by the rabbis under the gosh. Now nowadays they put a rope around and you can't even do it. But when I was growing up, it wasn't there. And you were able to literally walk under the arch. But the rabbis of, uh, of Italy made a uh, halakha, right? That you're not allowed to walk under the arch of Titus. Because that was actually one of the ways you declared if you walked under the arch. That's why it's made into an arch. You walk and that was one of the decorations that, you know, Jewish people have been captured and we're in Galut and they, they've taken our temple. Yeah, destroyed our temple. So you said earlier that um, we're all going to have Nibor when we're going to know who Mashiach is? That's what Joel says before. And now, it doesn't mean it's all of our jobs to have Nibor, prophecy, in order to bring Mashiach, or to know his Mashiach. The Sanhedrin will decide that. But the only way for us to... You said Nibor only happens in the land of Israel. So the only way yeah. for that to happen is for all of us to be... Oh, there. yeah. Majority of us be in the land of Israel and in the land of Israel. So before Mashiach comes, we're all going to be in Israel? No. A large amount of us, which we're seeing today, but it's going to gradually increase his job. Well, let's come to it. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're jumping ahead a little bit, but this is good. Yeah. Um. So the part about how we all like Mashiach is going to determine what shape everyone was from. Yeah. And then we're going to like re-split up into like. Possibly, yeah. So like, if. If we're all like being divided up into like Sheba again, like what happens if like people are like. Like, what if you, like, marry someone outside... If you marry someone, you join that person's tribe. If you marry a Kohen, you take on the status of Kohuna, and actually you can eat from Truma. And if you get married, if you're a Bat Kohen, and you marry a non-Kohen, you lose the right to do that. So, when we're all, like, when we know what Shevet we're in, and, like, that... Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Is it, like... Every Shevet had its own... Power, its own traits, its own mission. So, like, will that all come like that? Yeah, that's what the Raman just said. The Raman said that. That was a percent. Okay, let's jump even deeper. Says the Rambam Hil Malachim. I'm going to give you a checklist. Now, the Rambam is the only person that's done this. This is a wild thing for the Raman to have done. But here is the checklist to prove, first of all, to show us his mission. And to tell us that he is Mashiach. It proved that he is Mashiach in of itself. So this list has a twofold role for us. Now this list of eight things is going to be developed into five and three. Five and three. The first five need to be a potential Mashiach. The last three we'll see absolutely concludes that he is Mashiach, according to the Rambam, in the laws of kings. Let's do it together. Says the Rambam, if a king arises, David, he's got to be from the house of David. We saw that already from the Gemara. He's going to be direct descendant of King David from the tribe of Yehuda. Number two, Torah. he's got to know Torah. He's got a Torah. So it's unlikely he's going to be a young child unless he's some kind of genius. He's someone who has learned and understood Torah. How learned? Pretty learned to be a prophet among the Jewish people. I mean, like, what's the what, like, what's is the there threshold? A specific, like, threshold? Like, it seems very vague for like classifying like a big <laughs> figure. I think in that case, the Basic requirement, requirement is shas and poskim. That's how we pretty much define the Talmud Chacham. You know shas, right? Which, by the way, I was at a siyum of a 21-year-old that finished shas, right? And then he gave a whole speech of which I understood, and I'm not an Amaret, about 15%. 
So, you know, but it's also got to have wisdom. You have rich with all due respect to everyone here. 21 year old, not too much wisdom. You know what I'm saying? Having said that, I know 50 year olds have no wisdom at all. So maybe age is not part of it. Sean Malik was very, very young when he took on the kingship, right? He was uh, when he a teenager. So we assume he knows Torah and he knows the poskim and he knows Torah uh, enough that he's able to be a leader. What's Shas and Poskin? Shas is the, uh, the entire Gemara and all the halachic rulings that come from it. Okay. Not only is he from King David's tribe and from King David himself, which you have to prove we spoke about that already, and he's got to know Torah, he's also got to be Vosek the Mitzvot. He's also got to be involved in all the mitzvah. Wow. Isn't that obvious based upon number two? Number two is that he knows all the Torah. So why? Obviously then, he's going to do all the mitzvah, right? Not if he's like off the derech. So when he's off the derech then, well, I guess that would include such an individual. Well, that's a modern term. So the answer is definitely no. Just because you know Torah doesn't mean you follow the mitzvot. Right? There are many people out there, many Jews, and non-Jews actually, who know their Bible, and maybe know their Talmud, and yet are not religious and don't follow mitzvot at all. Many people who study this stuff, right? most universities around America, around the world, that Bible studies, right? when I say Bible, I mean, you know, the Torah, and they'll know the Torah, and yet they're not religious at all. Right? I remember my rabbi telling me, he was growing up, there'd be people in Israel, who would study Gemara and Shabbat smoking cigarettes. Because for them, it was merely an academic pursuit, another form of wisdom and understanding. That is not what we're talking about. This individual is going to know Torah and do mitzvot. And when we say mitzvot, we are incorporating two groupings of mitzvot, which are... Well, that's for sure not. Torah Shabbat and Torah Shabbat al -Pah. Can you translate that? Yes, Torah Bechtav are the mitzvot of the Torah, which includes the 630 mitzvot. And then we have many rabbinic mitzvot that come with that, an addendum, in addition. And there needs to be an understanding of all the Torah mitzvot from a rabbinic understanding. And the Torah says, keep Shabbat. It doesn't tell you how. The Torah says, shecht an animal. It doesn't say how. So we have an entire Torah full of mitzvot, but those mitzvot are headlines. They don't give us the full story. The Gemara, the oral tradition, are part of that story. Okay? Rabbi? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. A lot of the times when I like speak to secular people, they say that um, the all the Torah Shabbat, Kishabat Bel, and Kiru, is it, it's just people that <coughs> wrote things and like everyone writes a lot of things. And like my always answer is that it was given on Hal Sinai, but the thing is that they don't believe it happened. So what do you say to people who think like that means like. It's a very, very important question. I have a lot to say on it. It's not, it's coming outside of where we are right now. But Judaism does not make any sense whatsoever. Torah, the way we follow it, without rabbinic commentary. Again, the Torah does us nothing. How do you know what to do on Shabbat? How do you have to shecht an animal? So, so, the the, the last John, chalav chelev, spelled the same way in the Torah, with no vowels. How do you know if it means milk or fat? I mean, most of the Torah, like 99% of it, makes absolutely no sense. Unless you have some form of oral understanding that's going to give you. American law is the same. You have laws, and you have people arguing courts of law about these laws. Why? Just look it up, see what the law says, and that's the end of it. There's a nuance that comes with all laws. So the Torah, the simple answer is, it's a lot more to it. The Torah makes no sense without some explanation that goes with it. And that explanation was always oral, so there was, there's, a, there's a dynamic. It's an uh, organic reality that moves with time. But you're right, there'd be many, unfortunately, sects and Jewish cults, right? Even the Jesus cult, when it started, that rejected the entire oral tradition and went right to the Torah. And once you do that, all of Judaism is lost, which they predominantly did, right? Except, obviously, in their case, um, you know, Jesus. But when the Jesus cult started, that was pretty much one of their main claims, right? And up to the modern day, modern day movements, they reject the Talmud, they reject the oral understanding. And once you do that, it's a very short journey off the cliff before you start rejecting actual mitzvot or find your own reasons for the mitzvot. Okay, so there's a lot more to it. If you want, I'll post in, the, uh, in our class chat some proofs that 
lead us towards understanding, you need to have someone or well, understanding. Of course, but they say, oh, this just rabbi just said something. So okay, it's not just very regular. It's not just some rabbi. These were prophets among them, right? This is the Amshik Lesa Gadola, right? And before them, right, we have Nevi'im. This is not just a bunch of rabbis sitting down, like, trying to annoy us, right? Like, yeah, you got to do this. Say the Shema. When? Now? What does it constitute? That only makes no sense unless you have more information. Okay, leave that aside. Number four. The Kof Kar Yisrael Lechpo Al Chazet Barka. All this Torah and all these mitzvahs are meaningless, if you will, as a Jewish leader, unless you're bringing people closer to Hashem and to follow. Right. So Mashiach is going to work in Kiruv. Kiruv Kerovim and Kiruv Rechokim. I care about people who grew up with no background whatsoever, but also care about people who grew up with a lot, but you know, were probably never there in the first place, to be honest with you. Right? So he's going to be out there, bring people close, sharing Torah, sharing understanding, sharing mitzvot. Right? He's going to be an educator as well. And that's really what a king was to a large degree. Kings to a major degree. We're just walking around with the crowns on their head, you know, chopping off people's heads. Right? They were there as a spiritual guide and light. They may not have been the smartest right, uh, and most knowledgeable people among Kala Yisrael. Right? That's where you had a prophet. Actually, most of the major fights among the Jewish people, if you look in Tanakh, well, there's three groups among the Jewish people. You have the priests, the Kohanim. You have the Nevi'im the prophets, and you have the malachim, the kings. Of those three, priests, prophets, and kings, two of them were constantly in battle. Like, sometimes literally in battle. Who's that? The Nevi'im and the malachim. The Nevi'im and the malachim. Because what is a king? A king is a, a visionary. This is where I see our people going. That's why we need this piece of land to be extended. That's why we need to make peace with these people. That's why we need to go war against those people. All right? And the prophet's like, yeah, but if we do that, like, look what's going to happen. So actually, it's the other way around. The prophets were the visionaries, and the kings were involved in what needs to happen right now in order to make that happen. That's why you saw many prophets were killed by the kings. Because the kings said, we've got to do this. The prophet's like, yeah, if we do this, look what's going to happen in the future. He's like, well, I'll kill you instead. Right, until I get someone to agree with me. So priests were in the domain of the Beit HaMikdash, but the kings and prophets were Kantalagians. We're going to see a combination and a synthesis between all three when Mashiach comes. Okay? So he's going to have to do that as well. Number five, he's going to fight the wars of God. Now these wars, when I was a kid in Yeshiva, when I was a kid in yeshiva, I went to a very Haredi yeshiva, and the teachers always said, these wars are spiritual wars that will be fought. And in my yeshiva, they never taught us Tanakh. It was all Gemara. Right? And if you studied any Tanakh, it was because the Gemara quoted a verse from Tanakh. That was pretty much it. That was a kid. Unfortunately, why? It's very sad. Because there's nothing holier than a Torah. And I left Yeshiva not knowing Tanakh at all. My daughters, God bless them, they know Tanakh fantastically. Every story to memorize chunks of it. Stuff that I didn't even know existed in Tanakh. Okay? But unfortunately, the boys did not. If you look in Tanakh, it seems to be very clear that the wars for Mashiach comes will be actual physical battles. It's like tons of them. Among them, the most famous that you've heard of is Gog and Magog, who we'll talk about later on. There's a lot to say on, on that battle. Not that we know exactly who's, in different opinions, who's going to be involved in it. Some say the Jews, right, against the Bene Shmal. Some say the Jews against the Bene Edom, Romans, or the descendants. Some say we won't even be involved in it, right? It's just between those two. Many opinions. There's a chapter in the future book where I talk about it, bring down the various opinions on it. But that's a physical battle. That does not exclude the spiritual battle at the same time. And actually the entire battle will be based upon theological, theological and spiritual values. 
Rabbi Hirsch says the battle of Gog and Magog is Gog is Gag, roof. It's the battle of the roof people and the non-roof people. What does that mean, the roof people? Gog is Gag. A Gag is a roof. So people who put their faith in their roof and those people who put their faith in God, as in the roof of the Sukkah, for example. And by the way, Sukkot has a lot to do. That's where you read about Mashiach and Gog and Magog on Sukkot because there's this whole, God bless you. Bless right, you. the Sukkah is actually a reference to the faith that God, the Jewish people have in Hashem, putting their faith in Hashem and not in their safe roofs. There's a lot going on over there as well. I'll be Hirsch speaks about that. Okay, fine. But according to the Rambam, I'm just saying the Pshat is, these are actual wars of God. Physical wars that Jewish people will go through. Okay, at the same time. Now, that's five. If he does these five, you can assume that he is Mashiach. Okay? With everything else that comes with it. But those are the five. Number six, seven, and eight, says the Rambam, are going to approve without a shadow of a doubt that he is Mashiach. And what's that? If he actually is Matzliach and he wins the wars that we spoke about, and he conquers the surrounding nations that will be attacking the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Obana Mikdash Bim Komo. And he builds the temple Bim Komo in its place. place. What is he talking about? Builds the third and final temple in its place. What place is he talking about? What? Harabai. Harabai, as opposed to where? Not just anywhere else. else. Anywhere else? Right? In Israel. Elat. Tel Aviv. Haifa. That's not good enough. It's got to be exactly in its place. And actually one of the jobs of Mashiach he's going to have to use his Ruach HaKodesh and Nebuah for is to tell us precisely where it goes in Harabai because we're not even sure about that. When Ezra Sofa returned with the Jewish people at the end of the dispersion, the Galut, and rebuilt the second base of Migdash, he had to tell them exactly where all the stuff went. Where the menorah goes, and where the ark of it exists at that point goes, the Mizbeach. He had to point it out through Ruach HaKodesh. You're just like, you've got to know where everything goes exactly. We don't know where it is. And that's why many, many Jews, most Jews, will not go up into our Bible because they're not sure exactly where the Holy of Holies is actually situated. So he's got to build a big Middash in his place. And number eight, the Kibetz Nidchei Israel. He's going to be Maccabees. He's going to gather together the Jewish people from the Arba, Kamfotar, four corners of the earth. Hare Zen Mashiach Babadai. He got him. We found Mashiach. He does those eight, says the Rambam. We have Mashiach. If he doesn't do those eight, and all these eight, by the way, come from the prophets, he's not making it up. Ezekiel, for example, will tell us exactly the dimensions and size of the Beit There's no temple on Jerusalem, on Harabayat. There is no Mashiach. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you lived 10 years ago or 2,000 years ago. You can shout at me. You can scream. You can put comments on my YouTube, which I get. Tell me that I'm mistaken, that I'm a Khazari rabbi. He can't be Mashiach. Mashiach cannot be here because there's no temple and there's a lot more. There's, there's still wars in the world. We're going to see specific and very clear prophecies. There's no more war in the world. All of these things are necessary proofs that Mashiach is here. Yeah? Um, why doesn't it say anything about the, the lineage thing? It doesn't talk about that. But oh, he does elsewhere. Well, he does lineage. Beit David is the lineage. No, but he, I'm saying he, there doesn't say anywhere in this, in this um, about like being able to smell and say where everyone's from. Oh, no, 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 no. Because that's, the, I think the Rama mentions that specifically. Right, so that's part of our tradition, right? But the Rambam doesn't say that. Why doesn't the Rambam list that as a thing? I don't know, maybe it was just a, 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 a given? I don't know. And why was that the, why was that the one test that they chose for our cookbook that's on the checklist? Okay, this is the Rambam's checklist. And it doesn't mean there's, not, there's a lot more stuff that needs to happen, right? Once Mashiach comes. But assuming within Beit David, is this um, idea of him being able to smell and understand. Yeah. It's like a, it's an assumed understanding. These are just like headlines over here. Yeah. Um, 
Very good. Why are we davening? Why are we praying for peace if there are wars before Mashiach comes? Number one, you're praying that there are no wars. We already quoted a Rambam, which you'll see inside. It says no negative prophecy needs to happen, only positive ones do. Plus, a war can come, and it can be an easy war or a tough war. It can be a few casualties, it can be a lot of casualties, it can be no casualties. Right? In the days of Purim, there were wars. We don't talk about them because not a single Jew died. We won those wars when they came to attack us. Right, when Purim rolled around. So just because there's a prediction of wars and wars occur, doesn't mean. Now, it doesn't mean that war is always a bad thing. I know that we like to think that war is always bad. It's not. Wars can get rid of a lot of bad people. It may not be a bad thing in uh, and of itself. Right? Uh, and we pray for peace. We pray for shalom. It's a major part of our tefillah. We also pray for Mashiach to come. And we conclude. Because once Mashiach comes, there will only be peace and no more wars in the world. If there is wars in the world, Mashiach is not here. We may be getting close to Mashiach, but there is no Mashiach. Right now in the world, there are, I don't know, officially how many wars are there? Four? 20 to 30. <laughs> 20 to 30 official wars in the world. Sure. Putting aside little oh, in the local right domestic um, uh, towns and places. Going on right now. So right now, on right way. now, there are We're 20 to 30 war. wars. That are, some of them, some are famous, some of them are local stuff, but yes, plenty of official wars in the world today, yeah. He's on his way. So, I don't really understand, like, the time of it. Like, is it, like, when Mashiach reveals himself, then he will build the Beit HaMikdash, or if he builds the Beit HaMikdash? According to him, according to the Rambam, according to the Rambam, seems like him building the Beit HaMikdash is going to be proof that he is actually Mashiach. It's like anyone, like, Bibi could destroy... Oh, really? Right now. Oh, really? I mean, Do you know what would happen well, I, if I, a I, Jew I, right now went up at the Temple Mount? First of all, a Jew can't even pray. They're going to Israeli law to a mount, although we own it. The military could, like, hypothetically could just, like... Yes, that is true. The military could go out there, overtake it, because it is Israeli sovereign land right now, and always has been, but, you know, officially. Yeah? And World War Three, Four, and Five will break out immediately. So, good luck with that one, sister. I like to see that happen. I wouldn't like to be in the environs when it does. I do believe, however, as I'm going to show you later on, that they will voluntarily give up that piece of land and all land to the Jewish people and say, it's yours now. We held it in Olam Hazet, you get it in Olam Abba. This actually can be learned out from Yishmael, who did Teshuvah before, the, before he died. I mean, because Yishmael was involved in burying Abraham Avinu. So the Bnei Yishmael are also going to return. And this is actually based upon the writings of the Arizal. And do we know that the descendants of Yishmael are like today's Arabs? Pretty much. I mean, they say they are. So we'll, we'll take them at their word. Yishmael. Yeah. And the word Yishmael is a beautiful name. It's gorgeous. God listens to our prayers. All right? I'm going to... Um, from Chan Vital, who writes about the Arizal, he says that's because they're going to put us through so much pain and suffering in the fifth Galut. They will discuss in the uh, coming classes that there are not four exiles, it's actually a fifth exile no. that is coming right. This is going to be the shortest, and that's going to be the exile of Yishmael. And your future books, you can read that. And over there, he talks about why they got the name Yishmael. Wait, isn't he another zone? <laughs> We're in it right now. We're out of the fourth. We're in the fifth. That's okay, awesome. have a great day. We'll pick this up. God Cheers. willing. Thank you. Thank you.